Now, space is somewhere where you don't want a clash of personalities. You're going to be living for a you know, six-month extended duration in a confined space and a stressful environment. So in order to train for this, we actually train in extreme environments. One of these is in a cave in Sardinia, where we live for up to seven nights. This is where we can really hone those important soft skills, such as teamwork, leadership, followership, and communication. There are really three main things that we train for, a fire, a depressurization, or a toxic atmosphere. We have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades. On the space station, there's no plumber, there's no engineer, there's no IT expert, no doctor, no dentist. So the whole two and a half years is about giving us some exposure to these kind of skills that we might need on board the space station. Obviously, we would do this with an enormous amount of help from mission control as well. But after two and a half years of training, you're finally given a pair of Wellington boots and a lunchbox and <laughs> sent, sent on your way to the launch pad. That's actually a, a ventilation unit. There's <laughs> air flowing around in our space in our space there. Taking that elevator ride up to the top of the rocket is quite a daunting experience. After all, it's a 300 ton bomb waiting to go off and you're simply hoping it's going to be a controlled explosion and not an uncontrolled one. Now one of the first emergencies that we experienced was actually before we even arrived on board the space station. We were docking to the ISS, we were only 17 meters away and one of our thruster sensors failed, which in itself is not a major problem but it did abort the automatic docking, sent us straight back out into space again and Yuri, our Russian commander, had to take manual control of the spacecraft and fly back in for a manual docking. But thankfully, Yuri, he was on his sixth mission to space as one of the most experienced Russian cosmonauts. Very cool, very calm, so we managed to get the, the third docking attempt done with no problems at all. Now, whilst we brought the space station crew to six, of course, the ISS requires not just six crew on board, it requires an incredible <coughs> team of about 2,000 people around the world, made up of engineers and scientists and experts in mission control. This really, at the ISS, is the epitome of international collaboration and teamwork. And every morning and every evening, we actually start and end our day on the space station with a radio call that goes from Houston to Huntsville to Munich to Tokyo and then back to Moscow. We tie up with all these control centers to check in for the day and then check out at the end of the day. What are we doing on the space station? Well, it's actually a, a microgravity laboratory. That's why the space station was built in a weightless environment so that we can have these scientific investigations. So it's no surprise that science is the driving factor on board the space station. We study things such as uh, fluid physics, material science, pharmaceuticals, biological studies. Uh, in a, our six month mission, we ended up doing 250 scientific studies. And some of the things that I found the most fascinating were actually the life science, where we study the human body. Because the moment that engine cuts out and you're in orbit, you notice changes happening to the human body. Your muscles atrophy, your bone atrophy, your heart deconditions, so your cardiovascular system gets, uh, gets worse. Your immune system becomes depleted, your skin ages, your eyesight changes. It's amazing that I'm even here to, to talk to you this morning. Um, but one of the incredible things is you do that to fit and healthy individuals. It's a great environment for studying these changes to the human body. And so we can use that for the benefit of people back on Earth. This is where you will spend, or see most astronauts spending their time rather. It's in the cupola window. It's actually seven windows in one in a half dome shape. And it's always Earth facing because the space station is constantly pitching down so that the space station, this window, always faces Earth. One of the things that you first notice in space when you see the Earth from day is that you don't see any borders from space. You just see Earth's natural features, the geological features crafted over four billion years of Earth's history. I mean, in this picture here, looking over the Sinai Peninsula, millions of people are in this picture, but yet what stands out are Earth's natural features. But it's one thing to see all of that from the, the cupola window. It's a completely larger order of magnitude to see it on a spacewalk with only a thin visor in front of you. I had the fortunate opportunity to do a spacewalk with my NASA crewmate, Tim Copra. And this moment here where you actually drop down into the black abyss of space was probably the most memorable moment of the mission. Now, when you go on a spacewalk, you realize you're putting yourself in harm's way. 
But one of the things you really don't expect to happen to you in space is to drown. Uh, unfortunately, that nearly happened to my uh, ESA crewmate, Luca Parmitano, back in 2013. Now, we carry a lot of water inside our space, safe space. It's not for drinking so much, but for our cooling systems. And that water was uh, somehow managed to get into the ventilation system. And Luca noticed water coming into the back of his helmet. He ended up with about a litre and a half of water in his helmet. It's quite a dangerous scenario. And they had to get it back into the airlock very quickly. What's interesting is after Luca's incident, NASA had uh, designed a breathing tube that went from the helmet uh, area down into the torso of the spacesuit. So at least you could put your head over this breathing tube and breathe from a different area of the spacesuit if your helmet was filling up with water. And they also put a, a diaper, a nappy, in the back of the helmet so it would start absorbing water as it was being introduced into the helmet and just give you a bit of extra time as this, the diaper absorbed the water to, to get back to the airlock safely. So I just think it's, it's hilarious that a nappy and a snorkel uh, were NASA's solutions to this problem. But it, does, it just goes to show that sometimes it's a low-tech solution you know, to a high-tech problem that can actually save the day.